Good morning and evening, everyone. On behalf of the NYU Online Club in Japan, I want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Navigating the Cyber Domain, Evolving Dynamics of Conflict and Competition, hosted by NYU SBS Center for Global Affairs, CGA, and NYU Online Club in Japan. This session will be recorded. My name is Yuka Uebayashi, a 1999 graduate of the School of Arts and Sciences and the president of the NYU Alumni Club in Japan. Before we begin, please know all of us at NYU hope you and your family are safe and well in these uncertain times. The unusual situation created an opportunity for us to connect in total more than 1,000 NYU alumni and friends all over the world online on their seventh anniversary year. Actually, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, April 18th is NYU's 119th birthday. At the beginning of 2020, the digital document the communication transformation was like the internet revolution of 1998. Last year, however, digital trans transformation was accelerated by necessity and in larger part, our efforts to connect and function well in the face of the pandemic. As a result, we have seen technical technology eliminating borders across businesses, delivering knowledge across oceans, allowing governments to continue offering services, helping frontline workers battle the pandemic, and so much more. In this journey of technological progress, the biggest and most challenge, urgent challenge is cyber security. That's why we could not help co-hosting such a wonderful online seminar with CGA. Navigating the cyber domain, evolving dynamics of conflict and competition. Our speaker, Dr. Pano Yanako Georges of NYU SBS Center for Global Affairs, will guide us through the cyber domain, including security issues in the online world. And our moderator is Go Katayama, 2013, graduate of the CGA and committee member, NYU Online Club in Japan. If you have any questions during the session, please enter them in the question and answer box on your Zoom screen. We will get to as many questions as we can at the end of the program. Please note that the viewing option and layout may differ according to your device, your version of Zoom and your browser. All participants are automatically muted when they join this event. Thank you, Dr. Pano. Go and Michelle for coordinating this webinar. Now let's begin, Michelle. Thank you, Yuka-san. Good evening to those of you tuning in from New York City and Ohio gozaimasu to those of you in Japan. My name is Michelle D'Amico and I'm the Director of Continuing Education and Public Programs at the NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs. Since its founding, our goal at CGA has been to prepare global citizens to make a positive impact in the world. We do this through a variety of activities, including our two graduate programs, one in global affairs, and our recently launched MS in Global Security, Conflict, and Cybercrime, whose program director you will be hearing from during today's conversation. We also offer a variety of professional and personal enrichment courses in the areas of global affairs and fundraising, and this includes several professional certificates. And we host pu free public events such as this, that expand on the critical issues and timely topics that we cover in our classrooms. We will send out a follow-up message to all attendees, so please feel free to reach out to us with any questions you have about these programs. And we are very honored tonight to be offering this program in collaboration with the NYU Alumni Club in Japan, especially because we are able to feature Go Katayama, committee member and an alum of our MS in Global Affairs program, and a member of our advisory board at the Center for Global Affairs. I will now turn the virtual floor over to him. Go ahead, go. Um, hello and welcome. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Michelle. I'm very happy uh, to, to be able to host this uh, from Tokyo um, in, in collaboration with uh, my alma mater at NYU, a Center for Global Affairs. Um, today, um, the issue is cyber. And cybersecurity, I think, is one of the most important questions of our time 
but it's something that um, we I think um, doesn't have uh, enough coverage or you know uh, fr from a professional standpoint uh, we just don't know too much about it. Um, I've read the cybersecurity costs could reach up to six trillion dollars this year um, and and be higher than 10 trillion by 2025. Um, beyond the numbers, there's ramifications on the brand, supply chain, and all of these are under threat. Um, here to examine many of these aspects in the cyber domain, we have Do Dr. Pano Yanoko Georges. Um, he's the clinical associate professor and program director for MS and Global Security Conflict and Cybercrime at NYU Center for Global Affairs. Um, previously, he worked uh, a career in government, uh, civil service with the US Air Force, uh, finishing his tenure as the founding dean of the Air Force Cyber College at Air University. Um, he's widely published uh, on this topic, um, and he has a PhD in global affairs from Rutgers University. Um, it, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Yano Kodurgis on this conversation. Um, the format of this event uh, for the next uh, 50 minutes or so, um, he will give a 20 minute remark uh, to set the global context of cybersecurity followed by a 15 minute conversation with myself. Um, here, I'd like to be a little bit selfish. I have so many questions about this uh, uh, cyber, cyber domain. Um, so, you know, we'll do a 15 minute conversation and then we'll take some questions from the audience. As Yuka-san mentioned, please send in your questions through the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen um, as you think of them uh, during uh, uh, Dr. Pano's uh, remarks. Um, Yep, so that's the setup for today. Um, so Dr. Pano, uh, please, uh, if you could uh, give us your remark. Thank you. Thank you, Go, Michelle, and Yuka. I hope everyone can hear me and see the New York skyline behind me as well. So give me a moment while I try to share my screen. So Go, again, thank you for that wonderful and generous introduction. And thank you again, uh, Japan, uh, for hosting me. This will be my fifth time in Japan, first time virtually, fourth time, uh, which I would have been in person. So I'm a big fan of Tokyo and um, all the city has to offer. Today, I wanted to share a... Um, couple of perspectives that I have on cyberspace to kind of set the scene for the conversation that will follow with both Go as well as the participants for today. So I'll start off with a, just a general overview of what do we mean by cyberspace? How does that relate to globalization? And then I'll walk through a very brief history of cyber threats and how they have kind of shaped how the world has um, started to address and comprehend the threats that have been emerging from um, cyberspace. So you'll see on the left-hand side of this current slide, a map of the Alexandrian empire in ancient Greece on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, what someone might perceive as a network of fiber optic cables and ones and zeros and that kind of stuff. So you might be wondering, what does ancient Greece and a modern network have in common? So the, the bottom line here is that when it comes to globalization and the spreading of ideas and the exchange of information across cultures, we're really in not new space when it comes to globalization in that we have seen forms of globalization occurring for thousands of years. In the case of ancient Greece, we've had it through the spread of an empire with of enabling technologies of roads and language and in order to spread the message of different civilizational constructs and concepts. Today with cyberspace, we see a very similar kind of dynamics going on. 
So I'll skip over the two hour lecture on kind of the background of the con connectivity that exists in the ancient world and fast forward to today where cyberspace has really enabled the globe to shrink as a result of the ability for humans to interact amongst themselves without regard for geographic um, location on the earth. Pre-COVID, this was kind of a nice to have idea in the middle of COVID where we find ourselves with remote work, with remote events like we find ourselves in today. This shrinking of the globe has only become more apparent. And this has only increased our own vulnerability to threat actors who may want to exploit and who are exploiting um, this technical domain that we find ourselves in. So what is cyberspace? It's very complicated, very long, complicated answer, but for the scene setting for this morning, if you're in Japan or this evening, if you're in the United States, a session is intended to kind of give you a broad overview of what we mean when we say the word cyberspace. So if you look at this graphic, you'll see that it's composed of five different layers. At the base layer, there's the geographic aspect of cyberspace and that is intertwined with the layer that is right on top, the physical infrastructure. So these two layers are essentially the part of cyberspace that most people don't think about when they think about the fact that they're connecting with people across the world. It's the undersea cables. It is the electromagnetic systems and signals that are being communicated across the electromagnetic spectrum between Wi-Fi's and computers and that kind of stuff that enable humans to communicate. At the logical layer, we have the code that enables computers around the world to communicate with themselves and enable humans to um, exchange information across the globe when it comes to the internet. So that logical layer is basically that thing, that part of cyberspace that enables the humans to exchange information without having to carry a power converter, a plug with them in order to plug it into a foreign outlet and that kind of stuff. So computers can communicate across the internet because programmers have figured out ways to enable that internetworking and communication of computers. The tricky part, as we'll discover as we kind of walk through these preliminary remarks, is the last two layers, the cyber persona and the identity of the person. So a cyber, by cyber persona, what we mean there is a Google account or a Facebook account or a LinkedIn account where a person might have many of these accounts, many email accounts. You might have an account for personal emails. You might have an account for work emails. You might have an account for signing up to various commercial services. So your other two accounts, your work and your personal don't get flooded with spam. So that's an example of a cyber persona, just one person handling multiple cyber personalities online in order to receive information that's relevant to that individual person. The very top, we have the identity, which is the actual person that might be controlling a specific cyber persona that is internet working with individuals across the world in order to exchange information. The main difference with cyberspace versus other domains in the physical world, air, land, sea and outer space is that the private sector has been in charge of developing everything above the geographic layer of cyberspace. So 
that really complicates things when it comes to thinking through how can governments respond to things that are happening? How are governments leveraging this technology in order to achieve their own strategic interests and outcomes? And how does the private sector itself, who is the architect of cyberspace, try and overcome challenges when significant governmental, military, intelligence actors are interacting with this technology in order to achieve an outcome. The other thing is that cyberspace is not new. So this slide here is a picture of a gentleman who went by the name of Captain Crunch. So back in the late 1960s, the early 1970s in the United States, in order to make a phone call, you would have to pay a lot of money, a lot more than maybe the penny a minute that you might have to use using traditional telecommunication services today. It might have been around $5 a minute, a lot of money, especially when you take into account inflation and all of that kind of stuff. So this gentleman named Captain Crunch, um, uh, essentially discovered that a whistle in a popular American cereal called Captain Crunch um, that was offered as a gift to children was able to send, this whistle was able to send a signal over the phone line in order to enable free phone calls. So Captain Crunch would blow his whistle into the phone and would, would be able to uh, make free phone calls as a result. So we see in the early 1970s, late 1960s, the emergence of this hacker mindset that was very, really focused on just getting free services and trying to beat the system in ways that would just enable the common person to, um, to achieve um, uh, uh, the ability to, to achieve um, gaining access to, to free services. So that's 1960s, 1970s. So cyber is not a very new problem. If you ever hear somebody saying cyber is new, then you'll know right away that they just entered the domain and that they've just started to understand and trying to wrap their minds around these challenges that exist in the day. Cyber goes back, way back, arguably the 1940s, for practical reasons, I take it to the late 1960s, early 70s, when we see the emergence of these kind of hacker mindsets that are trying to take um, advantage of digital communications and technologies. You'll see here a picture of a gentleman named Kevin Mitnick. So we're fast forwarding now into the 1980s where you have individuals with very little programming skills, but a very stark ability to convince people to hand over passwords and phone manuals and other things um, in order to enable these cyber criminals to gain access to um, computer networks. So Kevin Mitnick was an infamous hacker within the United States context as an interesting side fact. The FBI and all the great talent that exists there was unable to catch them, so they needed to rely on the skills of a Japanese American named Chumoto Shimomura to finally take down, track down, and take down this hacker who had been hacking telecommunication services around uh, the United States. So today, Kevin Mitnick is a very famous, popular speaker. Back then, he was a hacker who was not using technology to take advantage of the systems, such as the whistle, but just using the skill set of a phone in order to trick people to give passwords and um, enable him to then gain access to systems. So eventually caught, eventually prosecuted, eventually put in jail, and eventually released as well. And he's now sharing all his information, um, information about how to counter uh, threat actors um, within cyberspace. So all this is happening in commercial space in the private sector, the US government 
for storytelling purposes was more or less asleep at the switch. They really weren't. There were still there was awareness that this digital infrastructure was a vulnerability. However, senior leadership was not um, paying enough attention to drive the right resources to the problem of cybersecurity. So in the 2000s, we had an incident called Buckshot Yankee within the US government. Unclassified, very public knowledge today, but back then what had happened was a USB drive had been plugged into a Department of Defense computer and essentially had enabled access for a foreign intelligence service to gain access to the Department of Defense network. This was a big eye opener in terms of senior leaders becoming aware of the significance of cybersecurity and enabled the starting of a cultural shift within the United States Department of Defense to start aligning resources, financial resources, personnel resources to the issue of cybersecurity. So kind of going from just the tactical criminal level of addressing specific incidences that happened at a tactical level now to senior leadership, understanding and comprehending the significance of the problem and allocating resources to try and uh, mitigate some of the risks from cyber threat actors taking advantage of vulnerabilities within the domain. An example of a leader in this space is a gentleman within the United States named Richard Clark, who was a advocate of cybersecurity, had the ear of the president of the United States and was able to start churning the discussion within Washington so that senior leaders would become attuned to the threats and start to advocate for the creation of strategies and policies to help guide the efforts of the United States government to start to mitigate the threat actors ability, uh, start to mitigate, start to create policies and strategies to mitigate, to, to create um, um, defensive opportunities to mitigate threat actors activities within US networks. So as these things were going on, there were events that happened in cyberspace that kind of raised eyebrows in terms of what's in the realm of the possible feasible when computers start to fail and what's in the realm of the possible and the feasible if a hacker that has the right amount of resources, the right amount of time, the, amount, the right amount of treasure and talent to cause significant damage. So this incident is from Russia in 2009 when a computer misfired ones and zeros, digital information, and essentially caused a hydroelectric dam, a hydroelectric facility to collapse on itself because the ones and zeros that the computer was telling the physical equipment um, were not aligned with the physical process that would have enabled the dam to have continued functioning as it should have been. So this was not the result of a specific hacker trying to attack this hydroelectric facility. However, it does kind of highlight the significance of the integration of digital technology with physical processes and what happens when ones and zeros in the digital sphere don't necessarily align with the um, physical process that the ones and zeros are supposed to control. Another example in the United States about a year later is the explosion of a natural gas pipeline in San Bruno, California. So 
Same kind of incident occurred here where the ones and zeros in cyberspace did not necessarily enable those who were controlling the pipeline to correctly measure the pressures per square inch that were going through the pipeline. And as a result, the human operators were not able to respond to the specific um, misalignment of pressures per square inch to the pipeline's physical infrastructure and an explosion occurred. So these past two incidents are just examples of what happens when there's a cyber accident. Anything that's a cyber accident, if there's the right amount of human time, treasure, and talent, cannot go from the realm of can go from the realm of science fiction very quickly to the realm of reality. So in both these cases, as well as any other case that you all might be aware of, where there has been a computer misconfiguration, there may have um, there is also an ability for the computer to have been hijacked by a person, by a hacker or a group of individuals who have a very deep knowledge of the system, at the engineering level, the computer science level, in order to cause a specific effect like a pipeline explosion, like a hydroelectric dam um, imploding on itself. So what's frightening in cyberspace, it's never a good news story. You know, we've gone from the 1960s where whistles were being used to get free services to a day and age where nation states are actively integrating cyberspace into their national military strategies in order to achieve specific effects to gain their own competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis other nation states. So in the United States, what's called the Defense Science Board, which is a scientific advisory committee to the Secretary of Defense, um, in 2013 released a report basically categorizing the different kinds of resources that are required to go from kind of your whistle blowing annoyance in cyberspace to an existential threat where things are blowing up in cyberspace. And the Defense Science Board's report laid out the specific number and dollar amounts of resources that are required. So at the lower level to create significant cyber criminal activity, someone requires tens of thousands of dollars. In the middle level, more sophisticated cyber criminal activity requires something in the realm of millions of dollars. And at that top spectrum, in order to create something, an effect like a pipeline explosion or a um, nuclear centrifuge spinning out of control, the um, amount of resources that are required are in the billions of dollars. Nation states are typically the only ones that have been able to afford something in the spectrum of billions of dollars to essentially create vulnerabilities in cyberspace. And the flags on the right are just kind of trying to give an indication of nation states that would have both the resources as well as the declared national security policies that would signal to the rest of the world that they would be in that category of a tier five to six actor who would have an ability to go out and start to gain access to systems in order to at some point in the future cause an effect that could result in grave economic or physical damage. And we've seen this. We've seen nation states that have targeted the Olympics, for example. Um, when South Korea hosted the Olympics a few years ago, the power went out in the stadium during the ceremony, and that has been linked back to hackers that were aligned with the nation state. Within the United States, we've seen and um, publicly called out activities that have been linked back to the government of China, uh, where Chinese government 
actors working for the Chinese People's Liberation Army have been actively hacking US companies in order to achieve very specific objectives that the Chinese national industrial policy has called for. So hacking specific industries that are aligned with China's industrial interests in order to gain information and enable the Chinese government to leapfrog the research and development phase, create products that they can then market and um, market to the world in order to gain competitive advantage against other companies, but also use to further develop their own industrial base. In the case of Russia, we've seen incidents where viruses that were targeting the Ukraine, which, was, which is an area that is um, within Russia's very specific um, um, area of hostility, where so viruses like Notpetya were released into, into the Ukraine, but because of the way that cyberspace is interconnected around the world, spread around and had very significant commercial impact on various industries ranging from the pharmaceutical industry and also the shipping industry. So Maersk is one example where NotPetya essentially froze that shipping company's operations for many weeks as a result of the infection that um, prevented um, prevent information about how, where ships should be going and what cargo existed on the ship from reaching the appropriate providers. We've also seen um, the integration of cyber capabilities into military operations. So this is an example where allegedly the Israeli Air Force um, was able to cause an explosion within gas tanks that existed within a, an Iranian um, nuclear facility. Kind of leap for, forwarding, leap, leapfrogging forward or going forward quickly for the sake of time. Um, we've seen that all military equipment, whether it's for defensive purposes for the homeland or for offensive purposes, but all military equipment that's purchased today is nothing more than a um, computer with very sophisticated engineering surrounding it so that it can sail through waters quicker, go through the air quicker, or float in outer space more efficiently. So, this is a, a graphic that shows the importance of, or the integration of digital technologies on specific military platforms, but we've also seen its integration on civilian platforms like cars. So think of a Tesla vehicle, something like that, that would have all these similar systems there to control the movement of a commercial vehicle through, um, through the, um, uh, transportation system as it exists today. What worries me the most, so as we've gone into a very remote environment as a result of COVID, we've obviously seen a large um, increase in the number of attacks targeting the remote work environment. I also described examples where we know who specifically did what in cyberspace. So Chinese hackers attacking US companies, companies around the world in order to gain information, North Korean hackers targeting Olympics. But we've also seen a very concerning trend where hackers that are resourced by a nation state are trying to pretend like they are the hackers of another nation state in order to avoid blame on themselves and pin the blame on others. So an example there, there's two really unfortunate examples, but that clearly highlight the danger and emphasize the ambiguity that exists in cyberspace. So, in 2018-ish, the French TV channel TV uh, Saint-Clément 
uh, was targeted by hackers who the French intelligence services thought were tied to the Islamic State. And what the hackers tried to do was essentially melt down the ability for the television company to transmit and broadcast um, their uh, news, their newsreel. After a couple of weeks, the French intelligence service discovered that it was not ISIS who was behind it, but the Russian intelligence services who had been able to hack ISIS and pretend like they were ISIS on the internet in an effort to try to melt down this television station. Very similar thing happened a couple of years later when the British and American intelligence services had been tracking a Iranian hacker group, allegedly, and they essentially discovered after 18 months of watching this Iranian hacker group that had been hacking US companies, UK companies, that these were not Iranians, but had been Russians who had hacked the Iranians, had gotten into the Iranian um, offensive cyber capability system and had been able to effectively pretend like they were Iranians. So that's the real danger in cyberspace is the ability for one actor to pretend like they're another actor in order to trick the victim so that the victim can misdirect their defense efforts and response efforts um, to, to the wrong actors. So out of all the risks from all the headlines and I'm sure you've all have seen in terms of the Russians are hacking the Americans, the Chinese are hacking Japan. In cyberspace, nothing is ever clear until there's been a lot of time and effort that has been put into clearly unpacking what's happening at the technological level so that decision makers can be informed accurately about who is hacking them. And it's that space that I'm kind of ending the presentation here as kind of a food for thought um, place where it becomes very frightening because with decision cycles being very close, uh, with decision cycles being very um, um, compressed in real space as a result of cyber technologies enabling people to communicate much quicker, we also have the additional overlaid risk of decision makers maybe inadvertently jumping to conclusions based on what is the analysis of the day rather than the facts of what is actually happening in cyberspace. So just as that scene setter um, go, I'd like to open it up for uh, discussion. Thank you, Dr. Pano. Uh, very insightful. Um, interesting that you mentioned the cyber um, is not new. Um, and uh, thank you for taking us through the evolution of cyber. Um, you mentioned it's not new, but what's new for everybody, I think a lot of people are thinking um, about this question, um, is that now we're working from home. Um, I'm wondering if you could say a few more things about the pandemic impact, You know how you think uh, working from home has changed the nature of cyber risks. Um, has there been a change of sources, a uh, spike in cases, um, and, and what sort of motivation um, from, from these attackers do, do, do you see uh, is troubling in this new environment? It's a great question. So the work of home environment is um, complicated. So it depends what industry you're in and what the kind of significance of a successful attack might be on that industry. So in terms of somebody trying to hack into an NYU alumni association cyber presentation, um, definitely within the realm of the possible, but that's not really where at least my concern um, lays it. Where work from home really concerns me is where governments have started to work from home. 
chief executive officers have started to work from home and critical infrastructure operators have started to work from home. So I'll break that down a little bit. When it comes to, to governments, so assume that this Zoom today is a cabinet meeting of the prime minister of Japan. Think of the level of information that might be exchanged there vis-a-vis -vis Japanese strategy to China. And if there's a Chinese hacker in the system, um, what kind of information that hacker group might be able to gain that could then be integrated back to the Chinese government in order to enable the Chinese to maneuver their diplomatic arsenal, their military arsenal more effectively against Japan. We've seen this actually happen, not so much in the remote work environment, but with Chinese targeting the Philippines and being able to kind of very quickly maneuver their strategies um, so that they can build islands in the West Philippine Sea and that kind of stuff. Um, taking it up a notch to chief executive officers. So if chief executive officers are using Zoom to communicate amongst themselves, they're also opening themselves up to or not Zoom, any digital technology that enables remote work. They are also able to, or potentially can fall victim to the same kind of information gleaning um, ability. What concerns me is the critical infrastructure sector. So we've seen, within the United States, an incident where a water treatment facility in Florida enabled their workers to gain access to the water treatment facility from home. Mm. And because they enabled that access, a hacker was able to get into the water treatment facility and was right on the brink of releasing toxic chemicals into the water supply in this community in Florida as a result of the enable, enabling of, um, of these remote work features. So that's the space that really um, needs to be more restricted in my opinion. It's that space where as we are trying to maintain healthy and safe distances from each other in the middle of a pandemic, we also need to kind of weigh the risk of inadvertently opening up cyber vulnerabilities and organizations that are responsible for critical infrastructure operations may need to take a more balanced approach to enabling workers to work from home versus safely enabling them to work on site to prevent incidences like what almost happened in mm -hmm. Florida within the United States. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, you mentioned about the C-suites um, and, and government leaders uh, and the critical infrastructure sectors um, that, that worry you uh, for this work from home situation. Um, but I guess to put away the doom and gloom sort of uh, rhetoric, I'm wondering, you know, do you, when you look around the world, uh, are you seeing you know, positive, you know, proactive approaches taken by governments? You mentioned, you know, the private sector um, has a lot to do uh, with, with how they, how, you know, uh, the cyber is, cyber, cyber domain is managed at the moment. But um, are you seeing any uh, private public sector partnerships that you see as a model for other countries? Um, any any uh, hope um, in, in this uh, cyber cybersecurity dome? Yeah, it's, it's really hard <laughs> to be hopeful. <laughs> And, and I'll, I say it's hard to be hopeful for one main reason is that the suppliers of the technology, so think of your big name companies, um, they still like to get Christmas cards from some of them or mm -hmm. holiday cards from some of them, but think of the main technology suppliers. Because they are not dedicating enough time and resources to designing cybersecurity in to their products, that's kind of why we're in this doom and gloom scenario to begin with. So I'll leave that as a separate issue altogether, but examples of good public private collaborations. Um, uh, a good example there might be the US response to uh, recent um, 
um, botnet called TrickBot. So botnets, for some of those of you who might not be familiar, is essentially a hacker, infects a lot of computers around the world, and then tells those computers to do specific things against other computers that are not to the interests of the owners of those other computers. So it might be a distributed denial of service disruption, or it might be an exfiltration of data. So there was a hacker um, group that had a botnet called TrickBot. And within the United States, the Department of Justice, Microsoft, a, as you all are familiar with that company, mm -hmm. And US Cyber Command got together in a room, were able to figure out what specific legal authorities all those three actors had. And it was decided that Microsoft would help clean up some of the, of the computer, of the malicious code that exists on the internet, while Cyber Command, the US military branch in cyberspace, would go out and do things to actively disrupt the computers that were being used to control the TrickBot network. So I think, although we've seen a lot of doom and gloom in the past, governments are starting to reach out to kind of your tier one, to, to, to the tier one providers and come up with solid concepts of operations to help defensively disrupt um, uh, criminal activity within um, that are targeting, at least in the United States, the United States um, victims. And, and those are things that can be done by all countries that have defense at the forefront of their own um, national strategic thinking. So um, thinking through ways that private corporations can work with government in order to not go out and attack another country, but use defensive measures in order to deny a threat actor the ability to steal information, cause a distributed denial of service disruption, or a physical harm against the country. That makes sense. Thank you, Dr. Pano. Yeah, um, just mindful of the time. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience, so I think I'll just get to those. Um, one question is, uh, you've spoken about bad hackers, uh, whether they are individuals or nation states. Can you speak to the role of good hackers or white hat hackers for governments and companies? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So they're critical um, to the ability to discover vulnerabilities, in my opinion, within cyberspace. So. White hat hackers, for those who may not be familiar with the terminology, are those that are those individuals that have very strong technical skills that are working towards creating a more secure cyberspace by discovering vulnerabilities within computer networks of private sector organizations, the computer code of products and that kind of stuff. So I think that their very important role is in vulnerability discovery. So discovering the errors in the computer code that malicious hackers might take advantage of and alerting private companies to the existence of these vulnerabilities so that the private company like a Microsoft or an Adobe can then figure out the fix to the problem in the code and then let the rest of their consumer base know what the fix is so that their consumers can implement the fix. So the challenge there is incentivizing people to be white hat hackers because these same vulnerabilities are, have a very strong, um, no, sorry, the discovery of vulnerabilities doesn't necessarily mean that you'll automatically go to a vendor because there might be a criminal organization out there who is offering significant amounts of virtual currencies, Bitcoins, Monero, et cetera, in exchange for the vulnerability information. So the real strength of the private sector is to create that financial incentive for mm. white hat hackers to disclose vulnerabilities to the vendors, whether it's an automotive company like Toyota, that might have significant software equities or others so that the white hat hackers don't 
become financially incentivized to go to the uh, malicious actor community with the vulnerability information. Just for my own sake, um, is it the correct understanding? If you look at the numbers, it seems like the good hackers are not keeping up pace with the frequency of bad hacking uh, in the last four or five years. Um, is that is that uh, that's sort of what you what you feel as well? Um, yeah, uh, I definitely think so, but it's definitely within the hand of the private sector to kind of shape the economic incentives for mm -hmm. white hat hackers to reveal vulnerabilities in their systems rather than enabling criminal actors by revealing the information first to the criminals rather than the software vendors. Okay, I have two more questions. Uh, I'm just going to lump one into one question because it concerns about the new, you know, cloud computing, uh, quantum and AI, uh, 5G. Um, there's a lot of concern about, you know, how prepared are we uh, for these new technologies and, you know, potentially China having the edge on some of these technologies. Um, uh, you know, do we, do you see um, sort of this movement I think there's like 30 billion devices today in the world that's connected. And, and that's increasing, as, as you, you mentioned, the world is shrinking. Um, do you s increasingly see this going from an enterprise risk to more of a, um, like a private risk? I do, but it's not impossible to stop because of how early-ish we are into the development of IoT, AI, and other next generation cyber technologies. And by that, I mean, so the hard part is in cybersecurity is ensuring that the technology is designed with security in mind. That takes a lot of time and effort within, the, within a software life cycle, right? You, a company will usually want to spend more time marketing a product rather than thinking through how to develop it securely. They'd rather get the code written, the features and the software produced, and then the product marketed so more people buy the product. I feel that IoT is a space that national governments, that's early enough in the history of IoT where national governments can lay down regulations for safety requirements for IoT, whether it's embedded on an automobile or embedded on a medical device mm -hmm. or another aspect of civilian society so that when these products are developed, there's more liability put on the vendor and the producer of the product rather than just assuming that the consumer will bear the risk of damage, death, destruction, et cetera, as a result of poorly secured by design devices, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, here's another good one. Uh, just looking at the time, we about five minutes left, but so where, where are the, uh, I guess one of the World Economic Forum uh, sessions that I watched called the, you know, the people, the training and the capacity of, of young professionals or professionals um, to stand up to these challenges. Um, I think they call them like cyber warriors or something. Um, where, where do you see, um, you know, uh, and also, you know, this is a big concern. I think uh, even, even in Japan, uh, nine out of 10 firms some saying uh, they have trouble recruiting cybersecurity professionals, right? This is no longer Bob, the IT guy in the basement, um, you know, uh, fixing things. This, is, this has become a very big issue, as you mentioned, from the top down. Um, where do you see, uh, you know, is, is this a challenging area of the, you know, HR uh, space of uh, getting talent in this uh, in this domain or um, do, do you start to see more programs uh, such as the one you're running at NYU um, uh, all over the US and the world? Yeah, so the, the human capital element is probably the toughest challenge we have in cyberspace. Um, it's, especially within the United States, because within the United States, there's not as much of an emphasis in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the kindergarten through high school levels, as there is in much of the world. I'm sure you all, or some of you may be aware of the fact that the United States 
performs very poorly on national uh, international competitions that have to do with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So within the United States, I guess that's the, the root cause of, of the cybersecurity problem, not enough talent that understands STEM disciplines. Um, another issue that I would see around the world is that most HR offices are looking for individuals who are coming out of computer science disciplines to fill cybersecurity roles rather than multidisciplinary, um, um, rather than coming out of multidisciplinary backgrounds. So that might be an additional challenge. So by that, I mean that, you know, the technologists will always have that steep understanding of how the ones and zeros of cyberspace work. However, there's still this layer of cyberspace that requires the ability for the technologists to communicate with senior members of a company or of a government. And technologists are not always the best communicators to communicate risk, to communicate resourcing uh, priorities to senior leadership to then be able to do the appropriate governance of um, an entity. And I think that that is where the biggest oversight has been um, around the world is that ability to find that talent that is able to serve as translators between the very technical community that does really good work and also leadership communities that have tons of priorities that they just cannot focus all their attention on technical issues, but need to be able to very quickly comprehend why they need to throw dollars or human capital towards a specific problem, which is what our program at NYU CGA um, is trying to do is to develop that cohort of people that can serve as those translators. Yeah, this is a, thank you, very big concern in Japan as well, where you know a big chunk of the industry is small, medium enterprises and they normally wouldn't have the resources um, to, to uh, have cybersecurity in place. Um, so that's an area that I think the government is trying to uh, incentivize from the financial side um, uh, going into the future. Um, I'm just looking at the, the time, uh, you know, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pano, uh, for all your remarks. I know we have other, I, I just saw that we have seven or eight more questions that popped in. Fortunately, we don't have time. Uh, today, um, but hopefully there's a way to uh, get these questions to you and, and uh, you know, uh, have them answered. Um, but um, just a quick uh, conclusion remark from my side, you know, again, Dr. Pano, thank you. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the world has shrunk. Uh, the cybersecurity is not new. It's a shared challenge. There's shared responsibilities um, and a bunch of opportunities. Uh, you know, it's not just all doom and gloom. Um, a diversity of actors to kind of work together. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just excited to see uh, all the different things that's happening, uh, uh, you know, and uh, I guess time is now, I guess, to act uh, on all these different issues. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Pano for your time and uh, everybody that's joined today. Um, and so with that, I, I pass it over to uh, Uebayashi-san um, for your final remarks. Thank you, Dr. Pano and Go, for sharing your expertise and your very insightful remarks. That was very interesting, and I'm sure everyone learned a lot. We invite everyone to stay connected with the NYU Online Club in Japan or our website and social media platform listed on this page. We also invite you to consider making a gift for students facing financial challenges during the COVID-19 crisis. You can do that on the NYU website at nyu.edu slash giving. That will be all for me. We hope you enjoy the event. Thank you again for joining. Stay in touch. Thank you, bye.